Sing Benny Goodman and his music. Hey, everybody. Oh, wrong square. There we go. Who's come up already? Morning, Chris. Come on, don't knock down my biscotti. Hey, Keely and Martin. Hey, Jeff. Oh, that sure did, didn't I? Hang on a second. Let me get online real fast and fix that up. Ah, it's just been so much today. I too must do a lot of cooking. Thanks for pointing out. Hey, Natalie. Hey, Nancy. Hey, Mackenzie and Lisa. Okay. Edit, edit, edit really fast. Yep. Next, back, next, next. Update. Okay. That should be fixed. I should point that out. Chris, I do that a lot, you know. Hey, Beverly. Hey, Cindy. Hey, Marty. Hey, Becky. Hey, Anne. Colleen and Rose. Hey, Jenna. Hey, Ian. Hey, Bob. Hey, Dara Octavio. All right, all right, all right. Uh, Mackenzie, no, we've, uh, yeah, we've, uh, the in-person tours are likely shut down for the season. Might toss one up in December just because the in-person, the, uh, the virtual ones aren't, uh, you know, there's it, industry-wide virtual <laughs> tours are not pulling in the numbers they used to. Hey, Alexandra. Colleen, I have... No one knows what those symbols next to people's names in Facebook are. Hey, Ann. Over on YouTube. Hey, Kathleen. Ian, it's uh, one that I haven't done in a really long time. It's been done before. But I hadn't done it again because the numbers were really low even back uh, last year. So, I don't know why. This one never quite caught on. But I like doing it. Hey, Ruth. Marjorie Tato over on YouTube. Hey, Sherry and Luann. Hey, Ellie in Ohio. Hey, Lisa. No, Brady, this is the normal time. Uh, there might be a thing with... Uh, Facebook changing time zones for people depending on where you are. That gets kind of wonky sometimes. So this is the the same, the usual 10 a.m. morning mini tour. Well, this is the full length tour, not a mini one. Oh, I don't know where my head is today. Hey, Zap. Hey, Susan. Hey, Joan. I'm, I'm all dressed like I'm smart here. I've got that look I have sometimes where I just go to the uh, clothes menswear shop and say, just make me look like an English professor in a sitcom. Make me look like I hang out at the Gaslight Cafe. Hey, Gail. Hey, Sue. Hey, Donna. Morning, Julie. Hey, Ava. Now, there was some confusion. I initially published the uh, Gold Coast tour to go on the same time as this one. That'll be next week. Hey, Jenny on the East Coast. No, my, my voice sounds okay. Does, it, does anybody else feeling like this is one of those days where the voice is really low? Sometimes there's a microphone issue there. Yeah, the Gold Coast event I accidentally put for today. It should be a week from today. That one's all on me. Hey, Diane. <coughs> but yeah, I'm feeling fine, other than it's rather toasty in here. And my usual chronic sinus issues. But every now and then, remember the microphone does that thing where it makes me talk like this. Like I put, like I played a 45 record at 33 and a third or something.
Hey, Luann. Hey, Laura. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Kathy. More than Teresa and Lisa. Yeah, Gold Coast will be next week. It's only been up for about 20 minutes, so I don't think too many people saw it too early. Hey, Susan. Hey, Amy. Hey, Octavio. Thanks. Hey, what's up, AJ True Crime over on YouTube? Morning, Jordana. Hey, sorry for the sorry for the confusion with a few people. The uh, the Gold Coast tour is next week. Hey, Linda. Hey, Heidi. Hey, Irene and John. Hey Mitch, hey Timberly, Joanna and Ava. Well, Julianne, I might have missed something up there. Ah, uh, Julianne, sorry to hear that about the dog. Hey, count over on YouTube. John, yes, I have been carrying the Stay Spooky Tumblr around. Thank you for that. Hey, Larry. Hey, Pamela. Hey, Daniel. Good to see you. Hey, Renee and Debbie. Hey, Timothy. <coughs> also, I even forgot to make tea today, so I'm drinking Powerade. Hey, Christine. Hey, Julianne. Hey, cat's fighting over on my good leather chair. Well, it's not a great leather chair, but it's, an, it's a low-end Ikea leather chair. But guys, it's not a scratcher. I keep telling you that. Please don't wreck my chair. It's hard to find good fake leather chairs. Happy birthday, Lisa. Benny Goodman goes way back and gets a lot of rhythm out of Walt Jenny Walk. Yeah, I didn't go to the coffee shop today even. Yeah, it's been a while since we did a Sunday morning one. October was just so busy. I gotta start getting my kitchen in shape for Thanksgiving, even though I think it's just the three of us. But, you know, I like the work of it. I like the ritual of putting it all together. Let's shut down the mail a minute here. Hey, Mary, look who's here, everybody. Hey, Mary, hey, Lisa. Well, Mary, you're, you're in luck. It's been a long time since I've done a proper Sunday one. Usually I've had in-person stuff going on on Sundays the last uh, six or seven weeks. Georgie, yeah, we have multiple scratching posts, but you know how cats are. Yeah, they, they do not lack for toys or scratching posts around here, by any means. Hey, Jackie. Hey, Dana, that's where I'm at. 23-pound turkey for the three of us, but Thanksgiving leftovers are my favorite food. Hey, John. I sure will. You might be able to see Priya in the background here. Lounging around with a cat dancer. Hey, Vanya. I'm sure Mariana's allowed to do some side dishes. You can kind of count on them. Tamales at Thanksgiving? I don't believe I have. That sounds pretty good, though.
All right, we'll give Benny Goodman a couple more minutes while people log on. <coughs> hey, Susan. My folk Pharaoh's out there today. I haven't seen him yet. Morning, Lynn. Uh, thanks, Rhonda. And of course, there are coyote pictures on the PayPal every week. And uh, yeah, Patreon. Okay, this is going to be a tour where I'm stumbling over words a lot. It happens now and then. We even have a little mini uh, additional basement freezer now in the storage space, which makes me feel real upper class, honestly. No, no, it's hard for a dweller, but I got an extra freezer. Uh-huh. Oh, there you are, Mom. Hey, David. Hey, Maureen. Down in Huntsville, all right. Hey, Gina. Feel like my grandparents? I don't know. <laughs> All right, we'll let Benny wrap this up. Music by Benny Goodman is being presented from the Joseph Urban Room of the Congress Hotel in downtown Town Chicago. All right. All right, so. Welcome along, everybody. I am Adam Seltzer from Mysterious Chicago Tours. Uh, apologies if you showed up for the Gold Coast tour that was announced about 15 minutes ago. That one is actually next week. Today we are doing Chicago's Spookiest Graves, one of my favorite presentations to do. And it's one of the ones that really takes advantage of the virtual tours. Because, you know, I do walking tours at cemeteries, but there are certain ones that are just too far away to really get a crowd. And I certainly can't do all of these in one tour because they're scattered all over the Chicago land area. But practically every cemetery, every self respecting cemetery has a couple of spooky graves in it and this way I can show all of them off. So welcome everybody. I'm Adam Seltzer from Mysterious Chicago Tours. I've been a tour guide and historian here in Chicago for going on 20 years now. I've got about a dozen Chicago history books out. I'm on the History Channel and the Travel Channel all the time. So I am in fact incredibly famous. You should definitely pay attention to whatever I say. You know, spooky graves kept me out of cemeteries for years when I was a kid, and I always kind of pictured them looking like these old-fashioned ones. I never went into cemeteries, so I didn't know that these were not really what you run into very often in the Midwest, like this one with the uh, bird poop tear coming out of the skull. This is the death's head imagery. You see a skull with wings attached to it quite a lot in old-timey graves. Um, this particular one is... Uh, I think this one is up in uh, Manhattan. But what really got me going into them at all was in college, they told me there was a cemetery in our town that had a water slide in the middle of it. And I wasn't going to miss that just because of some dumb phobia or anything. And yeah, here's how I looked in uh, about the year 2000. Still can't grow a mustache to compliment the beer that was going on there. This was going to be an album cover picture. That didn't quite work out either. Um, then the next college town I lived in had a place called Memory Hill Cemetery, which had lots of spooky graves inside of it, including a thing that they called the Taylor Fence. This was a fence. You know, we talk a bit about um, barriers around grave, uh, family plots when I do Rose Hill and Graceland tours. By the time people started being buried in Chicago, these were starting to go out of fashion. Graceland always had a rule about no fences around family plots, no uh, curbing over about a foot high. Then eventually uh, they just got started, stopped having barriers at all. But you go down to southern ones, you'll see whole walls, whole fences around people's family plots, including this one, which has skulls all over it. I think they recently redid this one. This is Memory Hill Cemetery in Milledgeville, Georgia. Um, my favorite thing there is this one that it's, I guess it's supposed to be Mary. 
but that looks like George Washington dressing in drag to me. Look at it. Try to unsee it once you think George Washington looking at this face. Now, incidentally, I was just digging through my files about uh, Washington's grave at Mount Vernon. Now, his body was moved into the current tomb at one point, and when it was back in the uh, about the 1830s, they decided, you know, we should open the coffin and have a look. And then they let it be known that his body was in perfect condition. But then there's also an account of a guy who went to Mount Vernon a few years later and remarked upon that and felt a tap on the shoulder. It was uh, somebody who worked at the place saying, It wasn't like that when they opened it up. So... One of those interesting stories. There were also a lot of stories that his head had been stolen by phrenologists years and years ago. But elsewhere at Memory Hill was a place called the Fish Tomb, occupied by one Mr. Fish and allegedly his uh, wife and children. The story went that when his wife and children died in a cholera epidemic, Mr. Fish locked himself inside of this mausoleum with a rocking chair and sometime over the course of the night shot himself. And they say that the rocking chair was still inside of the mausoleum. It was a common urban legend in Milledgeville for years. Um, finally, they opened the thing. They, they opened the thing up to restore it when it was falling apart. Found no rocking chair. Likely, the rocking chair, if it was there, was stolen by some fraternity years ago. But they did find a Fisk metallic burial case. These really ornate metal caskets with a viewing window over the face that were all the rage back in the 1850s. <coughs> they were supposed to preserve your body forever. In this case, they could look into that glass window and see it did not exactly work as advertised. <laughs> um, now also, I've, uh, some other places I've gone where I've seen some interesting ones is this one is up at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Sleepy Hollow, New York. Uh, it was, the lighting was really harsh the day that I took the pictures here, but the epitaph on this one says... Um, Let's see. Though mother is dead and the child left behind, let it truly be said that may it truly be said that father proved kind. I can just imagine the burial where they're all kind of looking at the father saying, let it truly be said that father proved kind, right? <laughs> um, you see, this one is up in Ohio, someplace outside of Cleveland. The rising morning cannot assure that thou shalt see the day. You see a lot of stuff like that in like late 18th late and early 19th cemeteries. This one, my glasses run my grave, you see, prepare in time to follow me. We don't really see too much of those in Chicago. By the time people were being buried in Chicago, having skulls and skeletons and really morbid epitaphs on your grave had kind of gone out of, out, out of style. Uh, but we do have some weird and bizarre ones and ones that inspire urban legends and frankly some that are just really cool. For instance, over at Rose Hill Cemetery, now, this is not Rose Hill, this is Mount Carmel Cemetery, which, of course, is best known for Al Capone. There is also one called the DeSalvo family. Now, the DeSalvo family, we don't really to know too much about them. From what I can tell from vital records, they were a working-class family up until the 1920s when they suddenly had a lot of money. We can kind of guess there might have been some bootlegging going on there. But there's this magnificent statue. It's a statue probably based on some sort of family photo. And I mean, as their faces up in there, they're kind of worn away by the weather over the years. And down below, it's got the pics. It's really the, the La Rosa family, I believe. But here's the thing about this one is that it is built to rotate on its axis. Yeah. Check this out. It looks very spooky until you see that my buddy Hector is pushing it back there. It takes a lot more effort just to, to move it than with just walking around it would. It's not the easiest thing to push, but you can do it. That probably happens from time to time. Not too much of it. But you see all these photographs that are taken on there. People would advertise this. Photographs. Better get those photos taken while you have the opportunity. Death waits for no man. Secure the shadow ere the substance fades. Don't get, get the children's portraits now. Don't delay. And he will please you. Van Horn Studio, Holyoke, Colorado. Now this is a guy who goes for the hard sell. Get your children's pictures taken now before they die. Of course, in those days, some people did wait until they die and took the picture anyway. Um, or there's also the case of perhaps the most famous spooky grave in that cemetery.
which is Giulia Bacola Petta, the Italian Bride. We see this statue of Giulia here who died, and depending on who you ask, either in childbirth or on her wedding night. We have records, so we know which one it is. And then down below, we have this picture of her. Well, there are two pictures. There's the one of her as a bride. And then right down below that, there's a picture of her in her coffin. The uh, epitaph around it says, This picture was taken six years after her death in Italian. Now, the legend goes that Giulia Bacola Petta died a virgin on her wedding night um, and was now considered for sainthood. Her mother started having nightmares that she was demanding to be dug up, and after years of going back and forth with the parish, they finally allowed it and found that her body was still in perfect condition. There's a few things wrong with the story. <laughs> um, we, she, she definitely did not die a virgin on her wedding night. We know from her death certificate that she died almost exactly nine months after what we can probably safely assume was a pretty eventful wedding night. Uh, died in childbirth. The baby died as well. Um, her married name, Petta, does not appear anywhere on here. According to the family... Um, her mother, Philomena, felt a lot of guilt. She had been sick during her pregnancy, but for whatever old, old world reason, she refused to let her go to see a doctor, didn't approve of her new husband, didn't approve of any of her children's matches. And, if, you know, Philomena, her mother, we actually have a picture of her now, was going through a rough time, I imagine. She was, uh, at this time, she had come over to the United States in 1913, and now her son's Joseph... Uh, Giuseppe and Enrique were her sons, Joseph and Henry. Her grandchildren weren't even learning her language. Um, it would have been very difficult for her. So when they got to something like this, not only was she racked by guilt, but she was like, ah, now you're on my territory. So, it, apparently it wasn't as difficult as it is sometimes said. She just uh, used her son's money. Her sons, Joseph and Enrique, uh, Joseph and Henry, had done very well for themselves designing women's clothing. So they were able to uh, secure the body to be disinterred almost as soon as Philomena asked. And I would not say that she's in perfect condition. She looks like an embalmed body. Uh, we know that she was embalmed over at the Ragos Brothers Funeral Home on Western Avenue, which still stands, uh, by the way. But I don't think the entire body is in quite that good a shape. But we'll show again. This is uh, But after that, her mother kind of strong-armed her brothers into commissioning this uh, gorgeous new monument that cost something in the neighborhood of $10,000 in 1920s money. They were not happy about this. It was something that you didn't really speak of in the, in the household for years and years. I was able to contact the relatives. They were, uh, they, they were remarkably willing to talk to me. But her... Uh, her husband by this marriage uh, later had another baby with the same name as the baby who died when she died in childbirth, and he went on to become a basketball coach. I tried to reach out to him once, but he didn't have an email address. He was just off in an old folks home someplace. Uh, you know, sometimes people like that, it may be that he didn't even know that his uh, father had a previous wife. But this was their house over on Erie Street. And since we're over on the west side now, um, this is out, Mount Carmel is out in Hillside. Also on the west side is a graveyard that was uh, used for one of the most famous train wrecks in Chicago area history. There was the um, a train carrying members of the Hagenbach Wallace Circus back in 1918 was rolling on the tracks between Gary and Hammond when a train coming up behind it from on the Michigan Central Railroad crashed. This one lists as 46 dead. There were actually about 89 or 90 killed. So what happened was... The guy in the train behind them had fallen asleep. He had been on the job for 24 hours straight. He had taken some medication that was uh, knocking him out even further. And didn't see a brake man so showing a signal showing that the train ahead of him had stopped. So he wound up crashing into the circus train, which was made primarily out of wooden cars and was using oil-based lamps as lighting. So this was not only a crash, there were also huge fires. Uh, the death toll just went up and up until it got up to about 90 or so. Takes 69 bodies from wreck. And this is what that wreck looked like. Now, one of the hell of it is, is that some of these people were the regular circus performers and could at least be identified as being missing. But a lot of them were just what they called circus roustabouts. People who would uh, get on in one city, work for a while, sweeping up, travel around for a while until they felt like stopping. It was kind of a hobo lifestyle at the time. But we didn't know, it was, so some of the people could never really be identified. Uh, we do know some of them. These were the Flying Wards, including Jenny Ward Todd, who was an aerialist. 
These were the uh, Great Dierkricks brother, Derek's brothers. It's spelled uh, D I E R C I K X, but I believe it's pronounced Derek's. And here they are lifting up an ele- uh, a line of elephants. Uh, now they have a whole setup for them at Woodlawn Cemetery in a section called Showman's Rest. Now this is a um, a section owned by the Showman's League of America where their members can be buried. And then along it, there's a whole section. Now the urban legend here is that some of the animals were killed and buried here as well, including some elephants. The animals were on a whole different train. There are no animals buried here. There's even pictures of the coffins being lowered into the graves here. And definitely no animals present. But only a couple of them could be identified, and some of it was just people with names like Baldy. Or Four Horse Driver. We can move on a little bit more. Now the legend is that you can hear the animals in the middle of the night. But that's probably because it's downwind of the Brookfield Zoo. And that's been known forever. I mean, Richard Crow used to offer that explanation back in the 70s on Chicago's earliest ghost tours. And there's even this picture. I don't like to linger on coffin pictures too much. But this is the spooky graves after all. Now, only a small handful of them. There were people that, were like in the, in the Derek's brothers, we knew were missing, but the bodies were badly burned and couldn't really be identified. It's one of a very sad piece of history. <clears throat> the um, driver of the train that crashed into them was eventually put on trial, but the trial resulted in a hung jury, and the prosecution decided to let it drop. Honestly, I would have gone after the Michigan Central Company for having drivers working in 24-hour shifts to begin with. With no sign of slowing down, he didn't have, he probably had several more hours to go that he was supposed to be staying awake. It's just bad management, more than anything else. I can't really blame a guy for falling asleep after 24 hours on the job. Uh, Let's move along here. Oh dear, I've got a whole lot, (laughs) there's a whole, I realize this particular part of the deck has a whole stack that I had declined to fix up. (coughs) But down on the south side stands the St. James of the Sag, down in the Lamont area near Justice off Archer Avenue. And of course, Archer Avenue is known for lots and lots of different things. Oh, it looks like my... (laughs) I've frozen in place up there. I can fix that, I think. That's not how to do it. That's how you don't do it, my sister would have said. All right, but St. James of the Sag is, uh, goes back to the 1830s. It is thought to be the oldest still-in-operation cemetery in the Chicagoland area, outside of, like, little family plots and uh, things from before Chicago was really, uh, really started to grow in population at all. But Archer Avenue has a long history. It is, uh, like a lot of the diagonal streets in Chicago, it started out as an old Indian trail, which sounds like it would be an urban legend, but in fact, it actually is true. 1873, there was a horrible train wreck nearby with 43 people killed. Uh, this was another one. The, the conductor ran away after this and had to be chased down. Um, a lot of the bodies were just kind of laid out around the Lamont area, and several of them probably ended up being buried in St. James of the Sag Cemetery. But it's difficult to know for sure. Records at this place are not very good. When they tried in the 1980s to identify all the people buried here, you know, they were able to transcribe the stones, but they estimated that they knew about a third of the people who were buried here. Partly because in the 1890s, it was generally known that this was a cemetery where you could go and bury anybody you wanted to for free. This was not really formally the policy of the cemetery, but it happened all the time and the cemetery just kind of went along with it. They really just said, well, please don't bury any suicides because this is a Catholic burial ground and suicides can't be buried here. Uh, But other than that, it was uh, a real problem. The priest would have partiers, uh, people who thought a funeral and a party were the same thing showing up in the middle of the night. A lot of times if somebody got killed in a drunken brawl or drank himself to death overnight, they would just haul the body over to St. James of the Sag. So naturally, there are a lot of unknown and unrecorded burials in this place. 
There's an awful lot of stories about the place being haunted by monk ghosts as well. There's one particular story that in the 70s, a police officer pulled up and saw four ghostly monk-like figures gliding their way up the hill, seeming as though they were walking without touching the ground. I know people who swear they've seen the police report about this. I have not seen it myself. But stories about things like this go uh, way back... Like, this is a story from 1897. A couple of musicians were staying out back. And you can actually see in the background there. You see that uh, chapel in the background of the picture. You can see the spire there. These two musicians were staying in a place that had a view of this. And said in the middle of the night, they saw this ghostly horse and horses and carriage come rolling up into the cemetery. And a woman standing in front up like this to block them. They said they were ready to swear on a stack of Bibles that this was true. It was over near the Sag Bridge, where there had, of course, been numerous disasters over the years. Around the same time, there was a story in 1897 that they had dug up the skeletons of nine people here. One of them was the skeleton of a man over seven feet high. This is almost a constant. Every time they find a batch of skeletons in those days, the newspapers say something about the fact that one of them was actually uh, seven feet tall happens all the time. It's part of why people were so easily fooled by the Cardiff Giant, I think. And a week before that, there had just been this advertisement, this uh, whole article about where anybody can bury a body for free. Now, the fact that this came a week before those musicians said that they saw that ghost is probably significant. It's, you can kind of imagine they got the idea to tell the story out of seeing something like this. But let's go up the hill here in St. James of the Sagabit to one grave that was mentioned in a lot of stories back then. Right, so this is the J. McMahon grave. We'll move up a little bit up to the side here. My beloved husband. It was a grave for a guy initially of a guy by the name of James John McMahon. But you notice there's also a couple of others here. Uh, Mary Frances Halligan, born 1853, lived until 1940. Uh, daughter of Daniel and Elizabeth, um, who are buried in the cemetery. Wife of John L. McMahon, Patrick Joyce, and Charles M. Cole. Now, the story went back in the day... Uh, that John died under mysterious circumstances. The official story was that a burglar had broken into the house and shot him. Several people suspected that, in fact, no, it might have been Mary who killed him. But no formal investigation was really made. Nobody formally accused her. There was just kind of whispers around town. But then she remarried, and according to a couple of the articles from back then, Patrick and Charles also died under mysterious circumstances, which continued to lead people to wonder about Mary Frances Halligan. Now, of course, while we're on Archer Avenue, it would be remiss not to mention Resurrection Cemetery, home of Chicago's most famous ghost, the one we usually refer to as Resurrection Mary, one of Chicago's great vanishing hitchhikers. And one of those ghost people pick her up in their car and offer her a ride home, then she disappears when they drive by this cemetery. If no one knows who it's actually the ghost of. A lot of speculation has gone around a girl by the name of Mary Bragovi, who was buried in an unmarked space over in the cemetery near her parents. She was killed uh, while driving around on her way home from a dance, with a, or on the way to keep dancing, with a couple of guys she had met at the Goldblatt Brothers department store down, at, uh, down on Ashland. However, we, this I've analyzed every first-hand account of this ghost. She never says what her name is, so it might really be Resurrection Ethel. Um, but the, the legend of the vanishing hitchhiker always has girls um, being at a dan being killed on the way home from a dance. Mary Bergobi actually was, but I think the story of Resurrection Mary and the vanishing hitchhiker here uh, appears to have been a few years old by the time Mary Bergobi even died in 1934. There are even those who say that it was really a girl who is buried at St. Casimir Cemetery, which is this one not too far away from there. And this one I'll just show a quick shot of. Just to show the deer who were showing up in this place the day that I was uh, out filming. And deer in cemeteries are remarkably docile creatures. Of 
You can drive right up to them. Like that one at Rose Hill the other day about stuck its head right into my window. But of course, no talk of spooky graves would be complete without a trip down into the woods of Midlothian for a place that has inspired more urban legends and perhaps more ridiculous urban legends than any other place in town. Out in the middle of the woods in the Rubio Woods Forest Preserve is a little place called Bachelor's Grove Cemetery. Now, Bachelor's Grove Cemetery has been more or less abandoned officially. There's only been one burial there in about the last 60 or 70 years. Um, going back to about that, it stopped being really active in about the 1940s. Shortly thereafter, in the 1950s, you start seeing stories in the papers about kids being arrested there for drunken shenanigans. It's been a popular place for teenagers to get drunk or high since at least the 1950s. And when you take an abandoned cemetery and a bunch of stoned teenagers, naturally ghost stories will follow. Now, people do have a lot of serious stories about this. I have talked to several people who have had experiences here that makes them never, ever want to go back. Uh, one person said they had to go into therapy after something that happened to them here. Personally, I have never had too much trouble going into this place. Um, it just feels like a walk in the woods down into a park to me when I go to this place. But we'll speed up the walk a little bit. It's quite a hike to get into this place. But here it is. Only a handful of the graves are marked. It's thought that there are about 200 people buried here, but there's only, a, a, only about 10% of them are marked. It's recently been cleaned up. There's a couple of groups that work on cleaning it up. They're fiercely competitive with one another. We'll move from the entrance here over to perhaps the most famously haunted spot. There's a few of them. It's a... Uh, it's got a fierce competition. But yeah, I always tell people the people that you meet here are weirder than any ghost that is likely to show up. For this, I went early enough in the morning that they hadn't really shown up yet. But this is the gravestone that was on which a picture was taken in 1991 by a woman named Judy Huff Feltz, which shows this woman sitting on that gravestone. And I've interviewed Judy. She will absolutely swear that there was no woman sitting on the gravestone. And this has become one of the most popular ghost pictures anywhere. I mean, usually you see it cropped down to looking about like this. Uh, this is a scan of her original copy. It's become one of the most famous of all ghost pictures. From there we'll swing over a little bit to another popular one. which inspires an awful lot of urban legends. So there's a, just an awful lot in general. There's stories about like a blue light that appears here, a guardian spirit that will mess with you if you plan to vandalize the cemetery, which apparently is not very good as its job because it was vandalized a lot over the years. The pond is uh, sometimes said to be a body dump for Al Capone, which is really one of your less creative urban legends in Chicago. There's a lot of stuff about this grave that says infant daughter. People like to leave things here. There's a, I remember hearing a story that if you dropped a coin on top of it, it would never actually land on the stone. It would move around of its own, own accord. I got my strategically placed thing here. I have a tra tra problem of going to these places on days when the light is particularly harsh. So I moved this one off at a distance from it. Here's one from when I uh, was out here with a group back almost 15 years ago now. The back of it looks like this. It is actually the Fulton family grave, including a woman named Luella Fulton, Luella Fulton Rogers, who is on the back right in this. Here's a... She was killed by a hit-and-run driver in 1944 and is sometimes said to be the, the ghost that you can see in the famous picture. I'll put, her, I'll put the, the picture of her up again here. There's another picture where her hair is longer and would match a little bit better. But notably, if, that's, if this was the ghost of Mrs. Rogers, and there were stories years and years back that the ghost's name was somebody named Mrs. Rogers before people could look these things up on the internet. Um, there were stories that that was the ghost. That's definitely not Mrs. Rogers' actual grave, though. All right, let's keep moving on. Uh, down at Forest Home Cemetery is this rather interesting one for the Lehman family. 
Uh, the Laymans were managers of a fair, a store called The Fair, which we'll be talking about on Thursday night on Historical Shopping in Chicago. It's a magnificently large mausoleum with these lions who just give you this death glare. The closer you get, the spookier they are with their little spiral eyes just glaring at you. The eyes seem to follow you if you move your head around. I'll pause it there so you can try that for yourself. I swear, even the head looks like it's following me when I move like this. And this is just a photograph of it, not even in person. Now, on the back of it, it has a date for 1902. And they even planned initially to have electric lighting rigged up in this place. So they could light it up at night. Miles? <laughs> it scared me there. But you can actually see inside of this one... And, in fact, there is nobody there. That's what it looks like on the inside. They never actually ended up using this mausoleum at all. It was actually for sale a while ago. Somebody had it, uh, there was a thing in the paper saying that the Forest Home Cemetery was trying to sell it for somewhere in the range of $250,000, which is actually a very good deal for this. There's one much smaller than that for sale at Rose Hill right now that would only hold about six interments, and that one was going for it going for like $900,000. It'll end up costing you more than two hundred dollars You'll have to do a lot of restoration if you want this one. But the Laymans didn't end up being buried here because instead they decided to build themselves a whole other mausoleum up at Graceland Cemetery. They've got this little stately manor of a mausoleum now. Maybe the lions scared them away after they were built. Or they just decided they wanted to be in a more fashionable cemetery. But elsewhere at Graceland Cemetery... is the grave of a guy by the name of Ludwig Wolf. Which is sometimes compared to a toilet. Which makes sense because he actually was a toilet manufacturer. Here's one of his standard water closets. And I've actually um, edited this photo a little bit. It actually goes a lot higher than this. I had to trim it down a little bit, do some photoshopping just to make it fit on the screen. Um, they, you wouldn't have really hit your head standing up from this thing. But... Interred there with him, it was actually built for the remains of his daughter Harriet. Now, Harriet was killed in the Iroquois Theater Fire on December 30th of 1903, a theater fire that killed about 600 people due to a huge combination of uh, skipping over corners to make the theater uh, get the theater open on time. Now, it's not generally said that she's haunting the place. She's actually in, and, uh, occasionally suggested to be one of the people that is haunting the site where the Iroquois Theater stood down on Randolph Street. But the story goes that similar to the fish tomb back in Milledgeville, if you knock on the door, you'll hear something. And back in Milledgeville, they say if you knock on the door of the fish tomb, you'll hear the sound of the guy blowing his brains out in his rocking chair. Here, they say that you can hear the sound of somebody howling. Often it is said to be a green-eyed ghoul who, gui who guards this cemetery or who guards the guards this plot. Now, you most likely this is just a pun based on the name. This is one of those ghost stories that got written up a lot over the years, but I find that it's one that almost nobody seems to believe. Like the people who will absolutely swear that Bachelor's Grove is a portal to the netherworld that will suck you into Oz if you set foot there, don't believe the one about the Ludwig Wolf grave. But I did decide to try knocking on it. And when I did, I heard something in there. You'll see in the video, I kind of you can't really hear it, but you'll see me jump back here. I'll leave the volume up on this one. You can see me jump backwards there. Now, of course, we're looking at a space here that is uh, goes right up against Montrose Avenue. And hill graves like this that go into a hillside are not a good idea structurally. This is one, it's kind of cracked open, but they haven't actually opened the doors and inspected the inside of this one in years. They know it's not in very good shape. Eventually, it'll probably just be filled up with dirt. Now, elsewhere in, elsewhere in uh, Graceland is this one that appears to be guarded by four headless statues. C.W. Sanford was a candy maker, but one time owned the largest candy shop west of uh, New York, or the largest candy factory. 
It is guarded by what appears to be four headless statues that might have been destroyed by vandals or it might have just been wear and tear. It is actually not four headless ones. It's three headless ones and one bent neck lady. Up over here. Another one off in Graceland is a guy by the name of uh, Frederick Seymour Winston. He was a corporate lawyer. So it's a dull job, but it's a really interesting gravestone. It's marked by four sundials representing the four seasons. Including this one with a raven on a skull. Such a cool looking one. There's also this one here. Um, I get a very Led Zeppelin vibe from this place. A little Black Sabbath there, Led Zeppelin here. Sabbath? Zeppelin. Sabbath? Zeppelin. And no spooky, what, spooky uh, Graves of Chicago tour would be complete without eternal silence. Built by Laredo Taft circa 1907 upon the death of Mr. Henry Graves who put aside $250,000 for the erection of a family mausoleum in the will. He said he wished it to be the most substantial and imposing that the funds set aside will allow. <laughs> I love his probate file. They've cro they didn't have the right uh, form that day, so they just crossed out insane and wrote deceased. But for some reason, they didn't build a large mausoleum that he put aside the money for, but they hired Laredo Taft to make this sculpture. And it attracted quite a bit of notice even in its day. This is a picture of it from an art exhibition catalog. The Eternal Silence by Laredo Taft. At the time, it probably hadn't formed that patina either. It was even a, a, a poet from Hull House. And this kind of uh, backs up my premise that it might have been a relative of his, Louise de Coven Bowen of Hull House, who commissioned this. Um, was actually commissioned to write a poem that goes along with Eternal Silence. Unmoved by thought of things beyond the grave, and silent neath the mysteries of night, that seem to quench the last of human sight, he stands alone, unterrified and brave, not like shaking coward or a slave, when all the whips of horror ceaseless smite, but like a hero who has fought his fight, and dauntless waits some certain power to save, for in his soul is sprung a strength unknown, for battling with the thews that throw mankind, compelling homage through he stood alone, and girl with fall like fears that almost blind these mortal eyes he feels immortal groan the silent reaches of his internal mind by Horace Spencer Flake there are a handful of urban legends about this statue one says that you cannot possibly take a clear and focused picture of it that's been disproven since way back in 1907 but it was probably a good trick back before digital cameras the other says that if you look directly in his face you will see your own death I have looked in its face myself I have not seen my own death, which I guess means I am living forever. His fame as a spooky statue at Graceland Cemetery is rivaled only at Graceland by Inez. Now, the reference in the last poem of the girl in fog made me think of this. Now and then this... Um, this glass case around the Nez will fog up, which probably led to some of the stories that the place, the statue disappears on stormy days. They say that the statue disappears and Inez haunts the cemetery. The old story was that she died being in a lightning storm after her parents locked her out. Though now we at least know that that much is not true. We don't know too much about Inez Briggs. We've been able to put together a lot about her family situation. It makes her look like her name is Inez Clark over on the gravestone. Clark was her mother's later married name. And honestly, I think she almost certainly would have had her own last name changed to Clark at some point. This is just that being the era. Um, and here's a nice shot of it. Now, Inez's mother Mary was 16 when she married a guy by the name of Wilbur Briggs. Wilbur was a big drunk. When Inez was about a year old, um, Mary told him to either stop drinking or leave, so he left. Here she is in the dark. One of the very rare times I'm able to get a Twilight photograph of this one. There she is with a coyote. She died of diphtheria at the age of seven. Her mother had just gotten remarried to Mr. Clark. And then, as I say, it does fog up, and when it does, the chair she's sitting in starts to look like a skull to me. <coughs> 
Now, one thing we couldn't quite clear all of the issues for to get in the book, but there is a picture from the early 19th, from we think the early 1930s in the uh, Graceland Files that shows it as without the glass case and with a flower bed next to it. Also, a better version than is currently visible of Delbert, her brother, who is buried right beside her. There's this uh, flower bed in front with a couple of doves, and there is an inscription on the end that's not quite clear enough to read, and boy, have I tried everything to manage to read it. It's like, computer, enhance, 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 enhance. That works so much better on television than it does in real life. And as you can see, people like to leave little tokens and trinkets for her. There were a lot of Legos there this past year. Um, here's the great job sign. Now, that we really know enough about what Inez was like or what she was good at or what she did or what she thought of school or what her, what her favorite games were or anything. But I'm sure she did a great job on something. Why they left her a severed hand, I can only speculate. Now, speaking of Black Sabbath, we'll move over to Rose Hill here. Now, over by the mausoleum at Rose Hill is something sometimes known as the Devil Grave. James Minnecaucus died 6606. And the inscription on the top reads, From darkness he came, in darkness he lived. To darkness he returned, and from darkness he will be reborn to a better time. The red is a recent addition. It used to be all black and white. Now, first heard of this and thought, this must be the most metal guy of all time. Now, as I understand it, he's not really all that into metal. He's actually just more into vampires. And he most certainly did not die on 6606. In fact, he's still alive. As I understand it, he lives about two blocks from where I'm standing right now. He's declined to be interviewed over time, but he apparently did some work at Rose Hill Cemetery and realized he didn't have any family who would be taking care of his remains after his death, so he thought he would build something ahead of time for himself that I guess reflects his likes, dislikes, and personality. I love when people do that. I love when people have monuments that tell us something about them. I mean, so often the epitaph is what I call high school yearbook ones, like loyal, true, um, you know, stuff that you write in the yearbook of somebody you didn't actually know. But this one actually shows us some of his personality, and I love that. Now, elsewhere in Rose Hill is another one that is occasionally said to disappear, probably because it fogs up when it gets, uh, when it gets rainy. But this is Francis Pierce Stone, one that was moved from the old city cemetery where Lincoln Park is now. And Frances was uh, buried here along, buried, uh, well, moved here along with her daughter who died a few months after she did. She died of tuberculosis in 1856. Would have been not even 20 years old, I don't think. But her husband was a guy named H.O. Stone, shown here in a picture from his mortgage company spread around in the, when it was still around in the 20s. But one day in the 18, four, uh, 1850s, he was about early 40s, went back to his hometown in upstate New York and met 16-year-old Frances, married her and brought her back to Chicago. That age gap wouldn't have freaked people out as much as it should have back then, frankly. After her death, he traveled in Europe, commissioned this statue, and this may be the second one that existed. Uh, according to a couple of old newspaper items, the first one that was built sunk when the ship went down that was carrying it across the Atlantic. So there may be another version of this down under the ocean someplace. It's probably not in good shape at this point. You know, marble, I don't know. Depends on where it went down and what the conditions are like there. But after, after this was installed at the Old City Cemetery, H.O. Stone went back to his hometown of upstate New York and found another teenager to marry. And she ended up living, outliving him considerably for obvious reasons, being so much younger. She was remembered by kids in the neighborhood as the most stern, prim, proper, and joyless old woman in the world. Though she did once host a party where Oscar Wilde met Marshall Field, which must have been... Really awkward, two complete polar opposite human beings. But this is th these ones, those last two were in Rose Hill. This one, another way too bright day, is one called the Pilgrim, the grave of Alan Polisek. This is down at Bohemian National Cemetery. Let's see how much of a view I could get of this. Here's a look at the face. 
It's another one where there are rumor, or there are legends that you should never look directly at the face. If it scares you, just imagine that this uh, this particular pilgrim is the wife of Bath from the Canterbury Tales. I thought I'm a bit over time, but I will show off a, a slideshow of some of the coyote pictures. I love taking pictures of wildlife in cemeteries. And if you're on the Patreon, on all tiers, on every Wednesday, there's uh, one of these photos is posted. Uh, here's a coyote at the grave of Marshall Field, like looking up, saying, "What's that guy doing? Is that food that he's holding?" Hmm. This is one of my favorites. I think this is the one that ended up in the Graceland book. It's the one from the beginning. One of them standing with the uh, Potter Palmer and Bertha Palmer mausoleum in the background. This is one kind of in my blue period. And one with the L train going back. Louis Sullivan is over there on the right. A coyote running past, running along with the L train in the background. This one, I, I tend to find that they're most popular when I can get the L train in there, too. Trying to get a coyote to pose with a train is not the easiest thing in the world to do. But I'm always willing to give it a shot. But all right, so that's Spooky Graves in Chicago. Here's some of our upcoming events on Thursday, uh, Thanksgiving night, if everybody can wake up from their turkey coma. We are going to be doing historical shopping in Chicago, uh, stories about um, how retail and commerce grew on Lake Street and then State Street over the years. We'll have some great pictures from old department stores. We'll have some uh, video of this year's holiday windows. At least I hope. I probably ought to go get those this afternoon. Um, then Sunday morning, a week from today, we're doing T Tales from the Gold Coast, one of our most popular neighborhood tours that hasn't been done in a, a good six months now. So, all right, everybody. We've also got mini tours daily at 10 a.m., but only available on the Facebook page. Fridays at 6.30, we do Whiskey and a Cookie on the Patty Vasquez Show page, where we... Uh, Drink whiskey, eat cookies, and discuss the events of the week. Now, should you need a Mysterious Chicago sweatshirt, hoodie, etc., cafepress.com slash Mysterious Chicago has everything you need there. Shot glasses, flasks, uh, car windows. Do I have one of those in here? Um, no, no, this is a patch. I had this custom made on a whole other site. <laughs> That's for work. I need that for work. And with that, everybody, we will put Benny Goodman back on and just hang out like we always do. So thanks for joining me. I'm Adam Seltzer for Mysterious Chicago Tours. That is the wrong uh, thanks thing. There we go. All right, and here's Benny. Laura, not at all. Absolutely excuse yourself. But historical shopping in Chicago around around Thanksgiving is kind of a kind of a tradition here. It's a good time for it. It was a Harry Selfridge, the general manager of Marshall Field, who popularized advertising how many shopping days were left till Christmas. Sure. Uh, thanks, Joan. Thanks, Sue. Lauren, thank you. Yes, they do. And thank you, Steve and Rob. Yeah, Octavio, I haven't put up new stuff on Cafe Press yet. I'm we're kind, of, kind of thinking of a new design idea. Maybe that's what I'll do this week. Now that I've turned the Graceland book copy edits in, I don't know what to do with myself next week. <laughs> I don't have a book project going right now. That's very unusual for me, especially with Graceland turned in. It's uh, That one's been about three years' worth of work. Prior to that, I had a couple of months with no book project, and that would have been the first time since, like, 2005. Dina, yes, I am going to be doing another uh, Only Minis in the Building podcast this week. Marjorie, most of them I don't have in good enough quality to put out on DVD, but if you go to the videos section on Facebook, they're pretty much all there. A Pullman shirt I could definitely see.
Uh, thanks, Kelly. Uh, thanks, Christine. Laura, yeah, the holiday architecture tour is, uh, it's on the list. It's a, it's, it's a plan for a walking tour. Maybe we'll do that when it's a hybrid or something. A cemetery coyote merch I'm not sure about. There's some, there's, uh, I don't like to spread them too much outside of the Patreon. When I tried, when I first tried posting them on Facebook, they ended up generating more publicity than the coyotes once. So you start seeing comments like, I'm gonna go out there with my AR-15. From, you know, that whole crowd. And then the people who want to go give them treats, which is also not good. But at least makes you seem like you're an okay person, not a complete maniac. Uh, Judy! Yeah, right now the only place to get the uh, Cemetery Coyote stuff is at the Patreon. But I bet I could come up with uh, come up with a version of one of them. I think I could probably do that. Oh yeah, Eleanor, these guys, I wouldn't say they're afraid of humans, but they don't let people get too close. Where are Miles and Priya right now? I think that's Miles as soon as he heard his name. Miles? As soon as this guy heard his name just now, he came running over. He was sitting in the window. The Serious Chicago Calendar. I thought I could put one of those together. Maybe I do a coyote calendar or something. Down Harlem Way, they're all trucking, and here's Helen Ward to tell you all about her. The thing about Stay Spooky is I, 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 I keep hearing there are other podcast hosts who use that same phrase, so I don't want to, like, market it too much. I might have to change it at some point. Nobody's bugged me about it yet. If you guys looked carefully, you might have seen them running around in the background up in that little top window today. Uh, you guys really want to see some stuff. I'll make this smaller. You gotta keep it up, but... Here we go. They go nuts when I bring this out. They wait for me to bring this out. Oh, I'm glad about my shoes, Miles. Let me kick these out of the way. Priya, you want to play too? 
Where do you guys see Prius jumps? She's pretty impressive. Benny Goodman presents On the Alamo. having a rare moment of letting Miles do most of the playing. They go nuts for this thing. They'll chase this all day if I let them. Yeah, you want to show one of your really big jumps? Really big flying leaps. Miles starts playing, Priya jumps right in and wants all the fun. Yeah, have a good day, Lisa and Sue. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and we stay right in the urban room of the Congress Hotel in Chicago and dance some more to Benny Goodman and his orchestra and hear Helen Ward sing, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Patty, I do not. I do not have a wall calendar. Have it in some time. I'm as paperless as I can be these days.
then we'll let the title speak for itself. Benny Goodman presenting Madhouse. Uh, Judy the Kitten is Priya. Well, she's about six months, six or seven months old now. They put that toy into the drawer, but they know it's in there. Priya's a girl. But she's a little firecracker of a girl. And she moved in here back in August. And she and Miles get along very well. They play constantly. They've been occasionally known to get it out of the drawer themselves. Ah, uh, here we go. Yeah, she is getting big. Miles is still a bit jealous of her, but they, they'll sit together all the time, they curl up on the same bed, and they play a lot. Uh, thanks for coming out, Lynn. Marsha, yeah, they meow. Miles let out a big yowler right when I was looking at the uh, Ludwig Wolf one. Miles is two, two and a half. And Priya does a lot of chirping. Uh, Carol, no, I started on time today. Benny is winding up, and I gotta go pick up Ronnie at her friend's place downtown. So, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, plug the upcoming tours one more time. Thursday night, meet us right back here at 8 p.m. for historical shopping in Chicago. It's really one of my favorite tours. There's, uh, there's fascinating stories in that one. And Sunday, for the first time in uh, over six months, Tales of the Gold Coast. Another really cool tour that I really enjoy doing. Such great architecture there, such great stories. And of course, we're, we got many tours every day at 10 a.m. here on the Facebook page. Tomorrow will be Mural Monday, and we'll have stuff all week long at facebook.com slash mysterious Chicago. Don't forget to check out the Patreon down below. So thanks a lot for joining me, everybody. I'm Adam Seltzer for Mysterious Chicago Tours, saying stay safe, stay strong. And though you may have heard it before, everybody stay spooky. <laughs>